generations of international investing who reminded us that the financial world does not end where people stop speaking English. Peter, you retired in June at the ripe old age of 46, and that was one month before the Dow Jones Industrials hit their all-time high. Was this time an intention, or were you just getting out while the getting was good? No, uh, obviously I had no idea what was going to happen in Kuwait. I think the most important thing I've learned in the last 20 years is what's happened to corporate profits. It's magic that in 20 years the Dow Jones average has tripled, and the profits of the Dow Jones companies have tripled. It's a direct relationship to what happens to companies' earnings, what happens to their stocks, and that's the key thing over time. Many people argue about whether markets are undervalued or overvalued. Are you suggesting then that they're usually fairly valued? They're always fairly valued. And you look in the last 20 years, Avon Products and Sears, these were great companies 20 years ago. They've fallen 30, 60% in price in the last 20 years. And, and over the same period of time, Merck, Coca-Cola has had their profits go up 15-fold. And guess what? Stocks went up 15-fold. So even if the Dow Jones today was 500, you would have been very happy to own Coca-Cola and Merck. So there's a direct relationship. That's what you have to concentrate on. There are people that own electronic stocks that don't know the difference between an e-prom and the senior prom, and they're trying to buy stocks. And the amazing part is the public is very careful with their money. When they buy a dishwasher, when they buy a TV set, when they rent an apartment, they're careful. When it comes to the stock market, for some reason, they just don't do any work. And it's not that much. A half an hour of work would save them a fortune. What would they do in that half hour? They would, first of all, see if the company had sales and profits. A lot of times they buy companies. There's nothing there. There's literally nothing there. Companies are, there's nothing to, to look at. When you look at most companies, you say, I'm going to tune in later on this company. I'll give you an example. Walmart started as a public company one month before the show. At that point, they had 37 stores. It was October of 1970. At that point, 10 years later, you could have tuned in to Walmart. The profits were up 20-fold, and the stock was up over 20-fold. It still had another 10 years left. Profits went up 25-fold in the last 10 years. You can make 25 times your money again. You have plenty of time. You don't have to make money. My best stocks have been the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year I own them. It's not the third week, the fourth week. People want the money very rapidly. It doesn't happen that way. You're going to be very disappointed in the stock market. Let me bring John in because you told me last time we talked on the air that you were now holding stocks for an average of five years. Is that still true? Yes, Lewis. We don't intend to hold them five years, but we find if you buy things when they're terribly unpopular and depressed, they don't suddenly come back. You have to be patient. Peter said the market in the end is fairly valued. You've made a career of seeking bargains, so you sometimes must think it's undervalued here and there. Very much so, yes. Very rarely is any share valued for its true price, a true value. They go in a single year's time, 50% too high and 50% too low. So it, it really pays to judge the values of corporations by the thousands in order to be able to tell which one has the lowest price today in relation to its true value. This past weekend, I was with a group of academics. I mixed with all segments of society. <laughs> and they told me that nobody can analyze stocks, that it's all just a random walk and a very efficient market, and that the kind of advice that you people give and the kind of analysis you do is worthless. How do you reply to them? That's just resigning from the game. If you take the game of tennis, exactly as many losers as winners, but that's no reason to give up playing tennis. <laughs> Good to you, John. Peter, you talked about the mistake of impatience. What are some of the other mistakes people make? And then let John answer that as well. But you start. Well, it's obviously not doing the homework and, and not looking into the company. I mean, if you don't know what they do, you have a rough start. The market in the last 20 years had 10 declines of 10% or more. And great companies go down. And in those declines, you have a great opportunity. I remember. And when the market went down in 1987, Dreyfus sold at $17 a share. They had $17 a share in cash. I mean, that was ridiculous. So you have to take an opportunity. Most people have the brain power. Almost everybody in this plan has the brain power to make money in the stock market. The question is whether you have the stomach for it and whether you're willing to do a little bit of work. That, those are the key elements. It's not that hard. If, if, you, if anybody has looked at Dunkin' Donuts or if they looked at General Public Utilities, I looked at General Public Utilities two years after Three Mile Island. It already doubled. I was able to make four times my money on it. it a very, the company was solid. What's your answer, John? The main thing that people need to learn is that selecting assets is totally different from almost every other activity. If you go to ten doctors and they tell you the same medicine, that's the thing to take. You go to ten engineers to build a bridge, they tell you the same thing, that's the base. But you go to ten investment advisors, 
and they pick out the same asset, you better stay away from them. <laughs> to say the same thing, to say the same thing in other words, the time when an asset is selling at its best bargain price is when most people are trying to sell. There's no other reason why an asset will go down to a bargain price. And if you wait until you, you, you're through the tunnel and out into the sunshine, you'll have to pay a premium price. If you even wait until you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you are already past the best bargain days. Many people think it's foolish to be a long-term optimist because we have so many problems in this country. Uh, there's problems of debt, public and private, problems of less than perfect political leadership in either party, problems of uh, a growing international competition. Uh, how can you buy stock for you just run for the hills? Well, the beauty of the stock is that if you put $1,000 on the stock, all you can lose is a thousand. I mean, I've proven that many times. Because if you're right, you can make five thousand. You can make ten thousand. You, know, you don't have to be right half the time. If you're right three times out of ten, and the times you recognize the company's doing well, and you understand what they do, you add to it, and you take advantage of it. You can make a lot of money. You're talking about finding companies. Yeah, that's Does all. Does the overall state of the economy not affect you at all? You, can't, you never can predict the economy. You can't predict the stock market. But when you, you look at Dunkin' Donuts, you say they have the best donut chain. You don't have to worry about Korean imports. You don't have to worry about what's happening with M1 and M3B. You just say to yourself, they're doing well. They know what to give you for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's what, what all gets down. What happens to the company, you don't own a lottery ticket. Time's on your side when you own a stock. You work, you work with that company, you'll do well. What do you think, John? We look to the future. You never think it's a dark future, but what do you say about these problems? There will be fair markets about twice every 10 years, and and recessions about twice every 10 or 12 years, but nobody has been able to predict them reliably. So the best thing to do is to buy when shares are thoroughly depressed, and that means when other people are selling. Is this one of those times right now? In all of my 50 years of investment counsel, I cannot recall a month in which there was such almost universal pessimism as there was last month in October. So that doesn't prove that we can't get still more pessimistic, but if you're already the most pessimistic in 50 years, you must be somewhere near the bottom. At the start of the past decade, you electrified our audience by predicting that we could get to around 3,000 in the next decade. They laughed when you sat down to play, but it turned out to be almost precisely right. Carter has now stolen a march on you. He's predicted 10,000 in 20 years, but what do you say in 10 and 20 years? I think the next 20 years will be just as marvelous as the past 20. In the past uh, 20 years, the standard of living has gone up 60%. The earnings have gone up threefold. The dividends have gone up threefold. The gross national product has gone up fivefold. And I would think our studies indicate that that would be what we expect for the future, including share prices. The share prices have normally doubled in America about every 10 years. So 20 years out, they should be four times as high. People say to me, John, now you're approaching middle age yourself, so when you get there, you'll have to answer this question personally. Uh, people say to me, gee, I'm 62 years old. I can't afford to buy stocks. I need income. What do you say to those people? They would come out much better if they would buy a well-managed common stock fund and then just tell the fund to send them what income they need to spend. Almost every uh, mutual fund will send you whatever you request per year, per quarter, a month. So it's a standard system, and if you trace it back, investing that way will give you the income you want plus capital gains. Peter, do you believe that stocks will continue to outperform other investments? I, absolutely. I, particular stocks. You have to be very careful. That's the key point. Some stocks, in the next 20 years, a lot of money is be made, a lot of money is going to be lost. I think the people that gamble and they buy options, what a tragedy if you're right on the company. You have a three-month option on it or a six-month option. Time's on your side. If you own the right companies and you follow them, it's, some people are playing, it's like playing poker without looking at your cards. They're playing bridge without looking at your cards. They own companies and they don't look at it. They call the broker twice a day to get the price of the stock. That doesn't count. You have to do a little bit of work. You have to be out to the malls, maybe a half an hour a month looking at why do you own this company. The reason is this sucker is going to go up. That's not a very good reason. <laughs> you, uh... You said earlier that you like companies to have earnings. You realize that many brokers will think that's needlessly picky. <laughs> well, when I, when I look over the last 20 years, I think more of the turnaround at Chrysler, the turnaround of Ford, the turnaround of Boeing. You have to say to yourself, does this company have a reasonable chance of turning around, do they have good products, and are they going to be solvent? 
be, tr be really sad to own a company when they're doing badly. Because I used to follow the textile industry. They had a great expression. It's always darkest before pitch black. <laughs> <laughs> when the last things are bad, they always get worse. You want to look to see if this company going to be around. Very important statistics. Thank you both for your common sense and your optimism at a time when we need both. We look forward to years more of your very special wisdom from both of you. One thing we've often been asked is why we didn't do a one-hour special filled with tape highlights. A special hour featuring some of the most memorable moments of the first 20 years of Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. When you begin to look at the world of the 1990s, uh, I think the United States comes down a notch or two. Should we abolish the Federal Reserve Board? Yes. What would you replace it with? A computer. Well, what is your attitude toward money? <clears throat> that it's a very nice thing to have. And how can we become more competitive in America? By a return to excellence. On most PBS stations, Monday...